Hi everybody, and welcome to the first episode of Season 3 of the Just a Person podcast, a show that explores life's highs, lows, and in-betweens. I'm Madison, and this week I sat down with Mason. We talked about his journey so far as a professional baseball player, how he knew he had to start taking care of his mental health, and how that has improved his life both on and off the field. Thanks so much for listening, and enjoy the episode. Hi, Mason. Hey, thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for being here. Um, I'm going to get us started with the random question I ask at the beginning of every episode. Are you ready? I'm ready. All right. Ooh, describe yourself in high school. All right. Um, <laughs> I think baseball is my biggest identity. I was um, laid back, uh, worked pretty hard in classes, uh, didn't go out or do anything fun or wild, really. I did one time. That's about it. I don't know. I felt like I was friends with a lot of people and fit in a lot of different circles. Now, I would say I was much different than I was now. Maybe a little less. Like I think I lived a little less aware of things going on around me. But I say it's pretty similar. Just laid back on like a lot of uh, good friends with a lot of people, and yeah, that's about it. Did you go to a pretty big high school? Yeah, we had um third three hundred and sixty kids in my grade, and now the high school that I went to has doubled in size since I left five years ago. Okay. Um, for me in high school, I went to a pretty small high school, but I was just like pretty quiet. I don't know. <laughs> I, I played sports, but I would say I was just pretty quiet, but try to be friends with everybody. Cause I think, I think it's like weird, especially in a school of the size I went to, to be like really clicky because there wasn't that many kids. Yeah. I don't know. That's, I think it's tough to uh, describe yourself. Yeah, for sure. I was, yeah, it kind of got me. I was like thinking back because I felt like I was a few different people in high school. But yeah, it is hard to kind of think back and look at that. Like if I went, I went to school with myself, who would I think I was? And I would like to say, like, no matter what group of people I was, if I were to meet myself, I would have like had a pleasant experience. At least would have felt like I was cool to everybody, you know? It'd be interesting to, I guess, ask like your friends from high school or like to see how they think you've changed to now. You know what I mean? Yeah, I remember thinking like uh, I tried to have as many little like personal things with as many people as possible like even if it was just throughout the you know walking to classes you pass the same people for the most part during the day i'd have like little inside like ways i'd say what's up or things to do with like somebody that i may not even talk to but like twice a year but like maybe i don't even really know them but for some reason i just try to have like a personal positive interaction with a few different uh or as many people as possible i do remember doing that like hallways and stuff i don't know i had a bunch of weird inside jokes with people that i didn't really know but it was fun i guess my parents helped me out with that there always teach us to be good to people so trying to like spread all positivity always so i guess speaking of your parents uh what where are you guys from uh, what was your life like growing up um we're from well i was born in alpine texas which is like small town uh west texas and then i moved to the dallas area a little bit east of dallas when i was um like two years old so that didn't uh I guess, you know, I have vivid memories of like a few memories of like the first place I was born, but we lived in a place called Mesquite, Texas, which is one city east of Dallas. Um, and my parents still worked there, went to school there through fifth grade, sixth grade, um, and then decided to go to Forney, which is another city over east, um, just because we thought it was going to be a better situation for high school, which ended up being a lot better. Um, but yeah, I just grew up a little bit around Dallas, like in my free time, fished a lot with my dad, I just spent a lot of um, I think I had a lot of important morals like um, instilled on me with like just regular things like eating family dinner every night, um, hanging out with family, having a close knit family and a good relationship with my sisters. So that was pretty much how I, how I grew up, just being uh, close with my family. Now, uh, you're, so you're from Texas and you've lived many other places since because you play baseball. Do you feel like that some all of those values and things are easy for you to take with you? And even though you're going to like different places where they might have different values? Yeah, that's an interesting question. So my first um, experience, I went to professional baseball as an 18 year old. Like when you're 18, you're not like the maybe leader or the figure you were, figure you were like when you're in high school um, where everybody knows you. Because I feel like I had a really wide like ability to like be positive and kind of spread nice positivity um, because of like being a successful baseball player when I was in high school and kind of being well known. When I went to pro ball, it was kind of a different experience. I was at the bottom of the food chain. So I remember almost feeling lost, like, how am I going to be that person again? Because I used to find a lot of fulfillment in that. Um, so that was kind of a weird adjustment. Um, kind of like figuring out how to not be the guy that everybody looks to and knows, you know, just being another normal fish in like a big ocean. 
um, you know, values. Like I definitely, they definitely translated over because I have a lot of like friends that I end up being a good relationship with, but I had a few friends that were like close family type relationships with. Um, and so I think that's something that I naturally sought out is like people to have deep connections with. Um, and I have a few friends that I've been friends with for the past five years from football that are extremely close because I think they share the same values that I do and we have each other's backs and that kind of thing. So I think my family and my upbringing like really allowed me to surround myself with really positive and good people on a deep level. And how old were you when you decided that you wanted to professionally pursue baseball? Because you started playing professionally when you were 18, but like how old were you when you decided that you wanted to go for that? Like since I was like four years old, like seriously, it's all I thought. Like I was committed to Texas and m to play baseball because um, you can commit and then still sign professionally. So I committed my freshman year, but like I never had any intention of going to Texas and m Like that was like not an option in my mind. Like I didn't want to do that. So I felt such a strong pull or calling to come play professionally as an 18-year-old. Um, so like basically since I was like four years old, it's all I work for like every second when I when I do baseball stuff, you know. Like, did you just like happen to play t-ball, or were your was your family really into baseball, or how'd you get into it? My dad used to play, and I think he kind of had his heart broken by baseball and injuries, and like things didn't work out for him. Um, so I think he was a little resistant to it at first, um, getting me into it. But my mom signed me up for uh, blast ball, which is like a little thing the year before t-ball starts, um, and I did that. And I think my dad just went out there and saw me playing, having a glove on, and throwing a baseball, and he just fell back in love with it. Uh, so I started playing baseball when I was four years old and then um, transitioned kind of into more competitive and select baseball over the next couple of years. And then by the time I was like eight years old, I was playing like the top level that I could play as an eight year old, you know what I mean? And then tried to play in the best level I could find all the way up through high school. And how does that work? Because I know for different sports, you do have to like at least do some college or you have to fully go through college before you can uh, be pro. How does that work for baseball? Uh, baseball, you're eligible to be drafted if um, you finish like high school, basically. So you can be 18 years old and get picked by a team. Uh, I know like basketball, you have to go one year to college, like football, three years. Um, <clears throat> but baseball, if you end up going to college and it's junior college, you can get picked after one year um, or two years. If you go to a four year, you can get picked when you're 21. So for most guys, that's um, after their junior season. And there's a few older guys that's after their sophomore season, they can get picked. And then if you're a foreign player, you can get signed when you're 16 and then they come up through like the Dominican leagues and then they try to make it to the United States by the time they're 18 and 19. And when you're like in high school and you're like, you know that that's what you're doing, right? You know, you're pursuing baseball. How does that kind of work with you also going to school and like trying to have like a, a life outside of just baseball? I'm sure it took up a lot of your time. Yeah. I would just uh, get up and go to school, um, have my baseball period do a little bit there and then after school basically i'd just go work out and do like lifting or throwing or baseball stuff until like school would get out at like four or whatever and uh i'd probably get down about seven o'clock or so I'd probably would put three two or two, three hours in um and then i do some school stuff eat and go to bed and just kind of do the same thing so it was a lot of school and i did as much baseball as i could at the time but um it wasn't like the whole process now i also didn't know all there was to training for baseball. And I've had to have people like educate me on that since I got into professional ball. But in high school, was, I just been like two, three hours a day probably. Um, and then once the season started, we had practice. So I would just do practice and then that'd be it. When you're like 15 years old thinking like I'm training to be a professional baseball player, how are you mentally, because you're so young, and how are you mentally handling like all the stuff that goes with it? Uh, it's kind of interesting because, like, I feel like when you have such a lofty, like, goal from the time you're a young person, it becomes, like, 100% of your identity and, like, 100% of your existence. And it's kind of, like, a dangerous thing because you don't know that that's happening, but it just happens naturally because that's all you're doing. Um, so every day I'm seeing myself as an MLB player and it becomes literally, like, my only thing in existence is, like, I'm either going to be a baseball player or I'm going to be a failure, like, that kind of thing. Um, coming up through high school is interesting. Like, I got... I got some good practice experiencing like pressure because I play like the showcases and there was college or professional scouts there. Um, but even at those levels, I never failed because I was like a lot better than the competition. That's usually how it works with guys that end up playing professionally out of high school. You never really experience like what it means to fail as a baseball player until you get professional or college. Um, so I didn't really, I just kind of coasted through. Like I felt like I just played good. I did good. Um, experienced minor adversity with some injuries but never competitive adversity. Adversity. Um, so yeah, it just became like hundred percent of my existence. It's like, I'm going to be a baseball player. And then I get a pro ball and like struggle and that like 
built up ego like kind of crashes down when it starts getting attacked because you're failing and then all of a sudden you realize like holy shit there is like an option where i don't make it to this because this is extremely hard and then like that kind of brings on all sorts of challenges that you haven't experienced before you know so it's interesting yeah that is yeah i guess i've never thought about that but like people that go pro probably never had really a hard time when they were kids and they they had this big goal and it seemed so achievable because you are so much better than the other kids and then you get there and you're like you're 18 but the people you're playing against maybe they're like 27 like it's very it's like playing on varsity when you're in like third grade you know what I mean it's 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 a very different thing so how did you adjust to that um so I had Tommy John surgery um well my first year I did pretty decent my first instructs um, so instructs is like where you play in the fall. It's not technically a season. It's just kind of like training camps, but you do play games. Um, so I did pretty decent there. And then I had surgery. So I got knocked out for 18 months, uh, from elbow surgery. Um, and then I had another like six to eight months of tail end of COVID where we weren't allowed to compete. So I had pretty much two years, like, um, not playing. So again, there, all I did was train physically, like actually absolutely went crazy and obsessive, like with training and I came out going really hard. So this is like, I'll try to draw the situation so like for training I, I finished like the you have to progress your throwing until like over you know six to ten months um till you're on the mound slowly building up the ligament that you have had repaired so I got to where I was on the mound phase where basically I'm pitching like I'm in a game um I've got a catcher but I didn't have hitters it was like imaginary um hitters and we were just throwing the counts and stuff um so I was throwing and obviously everybody I'm like striking everybody out but like there's not a hitter in the box so I'm just like because I've been training I'm throwing harder than I'd ever thrown I thought my stuff looked better I never thrown. I was giving myself a high school strike zone because that's the only thing I knew, which is like a bigger strike sound than professional. Um, and I was striking everybody out and I was giving myself like this false confidence. Like I literally thought like I'm never gonna get hit again. Like I'm gonna go from I'm gonna in low A because it's my first year, and I'm gonna make it all the way to the big leagues in one year. Like I'm never gonna get hit again, you know. And then I uh, came out of that, I went to that instructs, did okay at first, and then at the end, I had five out of the, my last six innings rolled, which means um in a game that's a training game if you don't get out of the inning they don't bring a release pitcher and they just say roll it and then the team switch um so if you can't get out of an inning in 20 pitches which should be pretty doable you can get rolled so i got rolled five out of the last six innings and like i remember i got i had one outing where i went three innings three innings rolled and i gave up like seven runs and then the rest of the game nobody else gave up a run and <laughs> i was i remember for the first time like not having control of my mind like my thoughts spinning like not being able to sleep, like anxiety, like, oh my God, like I, like, what am I doing? I'm not a good pitcher. And like, it turned into like, it manifested into this, like, I just got try to play catch during the week in, in between my games. And it was like, I couldn't hardly play catch because I was still in my own head. And like, when I, I couldn't hardly throw strikes, like it was the most miserable experience, like no sleep. Um, and so that was the first time I experienced like, damn, this sucks. Um, so my, my initial response to that fall was, like I got to get away from baseball for like a month or two. I don't even want to think about it because that was the worst experience of my life kind of thing. So I went and started lifting and working out that off season again, but I didn't throw or think about baseball. Um, and then I came back, built back up, but I didn't actually do anything to like tackle that like mental problem that I had. Cause it was like, if you're going to play, you're going to fail. So you got to tackle that. I just ran the opposite direction as fast as I could. So that, that spring training, I ended up like, I ended up taking like a, and it like messed me up super bad like I, I guess it's a super rare reaction but it gave me like um severe panic attacks and depression for like a year after that and like I was struggling that whole season without sleeping like puking up everything I'd ate like I lost a bunch of weight um but what that did for me is like that made me like turn towards my problems and I had to actually face them instead of running for them because I couldn't like they were there they're on top of me I was physically sick from my mind um so in that in that experience of that year when all I could focus on was getting my mind healthy I realized like how an important baseball is um, because there's things like in life, like just living a healthy life and like enjoying life is so much more important than baseball. And through those realizations, I was able to be like, if I fail, I'm okay. Like I'm still a person that's outside of baseball. Like it's not my entire existence, you know? So it's kind of a, we can get more into that as you ask questions about it, but I just had a very interesting mental health experience that turned me to like a place where I can like be okay with failure. So it's kind of interesting. So what kinds of things, during that time when you were working on like your mental health and your mental state, what kinds of things were you doing? Um, so a long time, I guess I was kind of like, I, I started like doing some breathing stuff just to get through the day. Like I would, get, I would wake up in the morning, maybe after like getting an hour of sleep or whatever all night. Um, I remember just like 
I'd go up to the rooftop and I would just start doing deep breathing, just trying to gather myself enough because it literally felt like anybody that's gone through stuff like that knows it's like every step and every second of your life feels like an eternity when you're in that spot. And I remember I was going to the facility, um, just the the sounds of people were like freaking me out, like people talking, things were sketching me out. I was having to run to the bathroom stall and just sit there and like try to gather myself and bring myself back to under control of my brain. I remember I'd be on the phone with my parents for like hours a day, just trying to like keep myself intact. Um, but yeah, so I started doing like some breathing stuff. It kind of helped. It, it kind of like faded out, got a little better to where I wasn't quite having panic attacks, but I was still like super depressed and like struggling. Um, then a therapist told me to get into meditation. So I started meditating um, towards the end of that season. And it was just really basic, like calm app, like focus on your breath, whenever it leaves, bring your attention back kind of thing. Um, and slowly my, actually within the next couple of days, I realized like I was able to apply those tactics when I was sleeping and couldn't sleep. And I was able to like get a lot more rest than I normally would. Um, and so sleep was the first thing that kind of came back into alignment from the meditation. Um, and then as I started going, I started realizing like my panic attacks started, instead of becoming like daily, they started becoming bi-daily and then weekly and bi-weekly. And they started slowly started fading out to where it was like I had one in like three months. Um, so I started meditating daily um, and I got myself back to a point where I felt pretty healthy. Um, and from there, I was like, I realized that the next off season, I was like throwing off the mound and I, like throwing the ball right where I wanted to, doing a bunch of stuff. And I like, afterwards, I was like, I don't think I've ever thrown pitches with that little thought and was able to execute. And I was like, I think the meditation is like without meaning to translating to baseball. Um, so meditation was the main thing that I started with. And I just kind of went from there. Cause I'm thinking about like playing baseball compare. I never played baseball, but I played like basketball and that's a pretty fast pace, like constant back and forth. Like you don't have a lot of time to think, but when you're pitching, you have, I mean, you don't have like tons of time to think, but you like you're stopping and starting and like everybody's watching just you while you're like getting ready to throw the ball. I can imagine that that mentally is pretty difficult. Yeah, that's crazy. You, uh, you're you basically you dictate the pace of the game. You're the one that like has all the control and basically like you have the biggest influence on whether or not your team wins or loses. So that can either like crumb, make you crumble or you can like really thrive in that situation. Um, and yeah, if you're up there analyzing, because you, you do have like, I mean, you take like 15 seconds between pitches, which is plenty of time for to experience a lot of negative thoughts, to experience all sorts of things that are challenging. Um, and if you let that time eat you because you haven't practiced your mental, like your mental skills, or you haven't been forced to practice like I was, then it can become pretty, like, you won't flash very long. You know what I mean? It's pretty tough. Um, but yeah, that's something. The other thing with being a starting pitcher is that not only do you have to do it pitch to pitch, but you sit down between innings and then you have to pitch five to seven innings and all of a sudden you've had to like been focusing for like two hours straight. So something that really helped me with that was I started, I start my routine before I warm up with the meditation. And then instead of thinking I'm going out to pitch, I think I'm going to be meditating for the next two hours. I just happen to be pitching. So I keep the rhythmic breath going um, between innings when I sit in the dugout. I literally sit there with my hands feet folded together like I'm eyes closed doing meditation. Um, and then when I go out and pitch, I keep the same breath going. Um, and I try to get into more of a an observant um, mental state. So like whenever emotions rise, something bad happens, I can view these things like these physical sensations and these thoughts rising in me that may not be pleasant. But then I can also like watch them as they leave my body instead of getting entangled with them and try to fight them and force them to leave. Like you just kind of let them run their course through you. And before you know it, you feel a lot more in control of where you're at. Wow, that's really interesting. I guess I've never thought about it. But yeah, you do have to like focus for that entire time even though you're not the one playing like you're still you still have to be ready to go yeah exactly it's it's kind of a weird dynamic it's it is challenging but there's uh that's the other thing i would say that really helped i did this for mental health but the other thing that translated fantastically to baseball was i started doing extreme like cold exposure and cold baths um and just for like people that are listening like cold dust can do stuff physically i think a lot of people look at it as like a recovery aid for your body but really i think the biggest impact is what it does uh psychologically so like it increases like your neurochemicals like your uh your neurotransmitters dopamine neuropinephrine like um it makes your cortisol go up and basically all these different uh transmitters like work together and they're what like works when you're focusing so if you can get in a cold bath and spike your spike these neurotransmitters you're going to have like more more for your brain to pull from to allow you to focus for longer and to focus more intensely. Um, and then the other thing is when you get in a cold bath, it's really uncomfortable. It sucks. You've got all sorts of negative, like this is dangerous. You got to get out. Like you got pain all over your body. 
Um, and so you can really practice getting to like that quiet observant, like I'm just watching all the pain I'm going through. I'm watching all the thoughts, but like, I'm not reacting to them. So that, that stimulus makes it easier to deal with the stimulus of a game and allows you to stay more focused and be more observant while you're pitching. Yeah. Does that help you with like, cause you have to physically train as well. Does doing that type of like the cold exposure thing, does that help you when you're like lifting or doing like pitching a bunch or whatever, and it like starts hurting? Yeah. It, it like helps you get through that. Yeah. If you're so pitching, it should hurt. If you're hurt when your pitching is bad, but when you're training, like say you're going through a long set of squats early in the off season, you're building up your body. It is really uncomfortable. Um, or even just the duration of these two, three hour workouts can be pretty like mentally, like, damn, I'm done. I don't want to get through this. But yeah, when you, when you do the cold bath, like, it literally makes you feel like sensations that are uncomfortable in the future. It numbs them where they don't feel, they don't feel as challenging. It makes it way easier to get through them. Like whether it's a life, something happens to your life or it's something that's happened physically, like cold, the being in the cold bath for one to five minutes a day has shown to like decrease or increase st- stress uh, tolerance in like a hundred percent of people to do it, especially over like a six to eight period week where you do it every single day. So it's pretty interesting. Yeah, I saw, I think there was like some article or something, because you lived up here in Michigan for a little while, where you would go jump in the river in the morning. <laughs> I was like, oh my gosh, I've never heard of that before, but if it works, it works. Also, yeah, I'd go down there and like, I love the challenge of that, so I'd usually walk down like in my swimsuit and stuff and flip-flops, and it's like, you know, it'd be like a foot of snow sometimes, and my toes are freezing, um, and I remember people walking by, it was so funny, they would like, Stop. I remember one time I was laying back doing my breathing. Um, had my head on like a block of ice in the water. I like heard something to my right. I opened my eyes and looked over, and there's like a girl behind a tree, like recording me. And then when I saw her, she like scurried off. <laughs> <laughs> so funny. But yeah, I had another girl uh, that was like, she actually ended up recognizing me as being Ella's boyfriend. But she was like, I'm gonna be honest, when you were getting out, I thought you were a crazy homeless person. <laughs> <laughs> yeah i can imagine yeah if i saw someone laying in a river now like in the winter i'd probably think they were dead honestly i've thought about that before i used to do that like personally just uh like after sports they'd have like a big tub and you could just dip in there after you played but i i haven't like i've never heard before of people doing it to prepare to play yeah i think it's more beneficial because there's There's some research, like it's kind of um, in between on like how much it benefits body stuff for actual recovery. And it makes sense, like they can decrease inflammation. But I think one of the problems with that is it actually could be a negative thing. Because like if you think about your body, like inflammation, not swelling, but like a natural inflammation is a response that triggers blood flow and nutrient uptake. So like it makes you create adaptations in your body to recover. So if I've just pitched a six inning game, I don't want to go sit in a cold bath for five minutes and numb that inflammation because that's going to like that's going to stop my body's ability to adapt to what I just asked it to do. Um, so that's why if you do it beforehand, it just like is a mental benefit um, and it gets your adrenaline going. Um, but I don't do it after recovery because it actually can like stunt your ability to like recover throughout a season, which is kind of interesting, which is backwards from what I think a lot of, a lot of things that have been taught throughout the years. But yeah. As like a professional athlete, uh, you're, you work your way up through I don't know, through like the different levels. And you're a pitcher. And I feel like being a pitcher is similar to being like a quarterback. It's like everyone wants to be the pitcher. Everyone wants to be the quarterback. And so it's like a very cutthroat, like to do it at such a high level is I'm sure like pretty intense to even get into it, to like even get a job as a pitcher. So how do you approach just thinking about like, how intense of a job that is or like how difficult it can be to get yeah so like it is there's like five starting spots and uh kind of depends i mean they're paying on a roster like relieving relief pitching spots i personally want to be a starter in the long run but like with the situation i'm in now because i'm younger and i haven't had big league experience i might be like a relief pitcher uh for a little bit hopefully transition to a starter later in my career but like like you're saying so there's limited spots um i think one of the worst things a player can do is be a mental gm like i could get here sit here and I'm on the big league roster for the Tigers. I'm like, I have to make the cutter. They have to send me back to the Rangers, basically. Um, and I could say, like, okay, well, this spot's taken, this spot's taken. These two spots are open. I'm competing against this guy and this guy. And, like, I could all of a sudden, before you know it, be, like, almost rooting against people that are on my team. They're supposed to be my teammates. I could be, like, um, a negative, like, cancer in the locker room. Like, just anybody could become that if you allow yourself to become, like, a mental GM. So I think the most important thing is just understanding there's so much that's out of your control. 
at the end of the day, you just got to go give it your best effort and be at peace with what the results are. And also like pull for your teammates to do good because like at the end of the day, if you're around pitchers that are doing well, like it also elevates your game. Um, and it's just a lot more enjoyable and more fun. And every nobody likes the guy that's like rooting for people to do that. So that's the way I've gone at it. Like I've gotten to meet a lot of the Tigers pitchers and they've all been extremely cool. Like the culture I can tell amongst these guys is really good. And they've been really supportive and I'm just going to be the same way to them. And even though we're competing with and against each other, it's just like, you just have to write it out. And like those thoughts don't, I hear people like tell you, like you'll have like a GM or some coach stand up in front of a group of guys and be like, we don't want players that are like rooting against their teammates and like have those thoughts in their mind. It's like bullshit. We're all human. Like you're going to be watching your teammate pitching who might be one of your best friends and you're both competing to move up the double A and he starts struggling and there's going to be thoughts inside of you like that are like, this is good for me. And I think the difference is everybody has them, but it's like, do you interact with those thoughts or do you let them pass is the important thing. And I think a lot of people don't understand how to like observe thoughts and let them pass. Like it's, they think that every thought they have is associated with who they are. So you can have these thoughts and not feel guilty about them and also not interact with them. And I think that's the most important thing to do. Do you think that um, being at like the top of your profession, basically, because you like if I were whatever I would choose to like if you were working in marketing or something, you work towards your whole career being like the VP of marketing somewhere. But and you might be like 50 when that happens. But when you play sports, you have to be at the top of your game when you're like. 25 you know what I mean it's like you haven't even barely had time to I don't it's it's so different because you're just so young do you think that that is like that's like a pretty difficult thing because you have to be just on your game like right out of high school yeah I think that's interesting they I guess like yeah compared to other professions like if you're at the equivalent of a big league pitcher and you're a business job you're probably like 40 or 50 so you've had more time to like mentally develop um I think that's kind of the cool part about baseball, but it's also the danger is like there could be somebody who has success at a young age and you can tell it like feeds their ego right away. Um, or it could be the opposite. They fail and then they're just completely crushed and don't feel human anymore, you know? Um, but yeah, it's, it is interesting. You got to be like on top of your game at such a young age. Um, and I think that just shows why it's also important to be on top of your mental game at such a young age because everybody's going to feel these things come up like an ego becoming bigger if you're you know on tv playing baseball but like do you interact with it or not it's like the common theme amongst like who ends up being a good person or who's like a shitty teammate who doesn't have success off the field you know so i think just everybody needs to learning the just the skills of observing all your thoughts and feelings is like the most important thing i think to, when you're having success at a young age or an old age honestly but i feel like a young age it's less likely you're going to have those thoughts <laughs> yeah for sure um, you were talking earlier about how all of your, um, like your mental work applies to baseball and how you kind of started seeing that bleed into it. Is there anything that you've learned from baseball that you just apply to your regular life? Hmm. I guess, um, I'm pretty competitive and I get going about things like that, that switch. I like to think like, um, it's almost like this, like warrior mindset. Like it's like this. If you read, there's like a book I'm reading, they talk about like uh, this guy is a, a Navy SEAL wrote it. And he was saying that like Navy SEALs are absolutely, when you're hanging out with them, some of the most relaxed, like loose, funny, like friendly guys you hang out with. But they have like a mode they flip the switch into and like that competitiveness like can come out or that like killer instinct, whatever. So it's kind of similar to baseball. It's like a lot of elite baseball players are so relaxed and so like chilling guys. And I feel like that is a good way to describe myself. But then certain things can trigger that response just to get flipped. Um, and all of a sudden, you know, you're surrounded by people who don't usually don't know how to interact with that because they like don't they don't play a sport or whatever. And then like you're uh, maybe saying something or like offended somebody. Like even playing a family board game on a on a Sunday night, I did this one time and I like got fired up and dropped the f bomb. And Ella's mom is like, "We don't say that." <laughs> like, like it just that so it's, it's not translating my life in a positive way. Though is that I found that in a lot of situations I can tap into like a different competitive nature that uh, I don't know if a lot of people have if they haven't played sports at eye level. My last question, I always ask people if they have any advice for, um, it could be a professional baseball player, but more widely like people that are striving to be kind of at the top of their field or the best that they can be at what they're doing. Yeah, I think, um, hmm, this is a deep cup question. Could be. <laughs> um, I think everybody needs to proactively like work on their mind. Um, 
Gosh, it just, it's so hard to say because I heard that my whole life and I just thought like, ah, whatever, I don't need to work on that until, you know, life for your, your own brain, like mind smacks you in the face. Um, I would say it's super important to almost explore or understand the depth of your own, like, capacity to be like a negative person or evil or the, your own capacity to be sick in the mind. It's like, okay and important to look into that because like without understanding the depth of like your own evil or like, your sickness, you can't actually be like, good you, because it's like it's kind of like i heard the psychologist say if you're if you're just a good person but you don't know that you can be evil or you're a healthy person and you don't know you can be sick you're just like kind of a domesticated dog walking around that's like just friendly but you're not actually making a choice to be friendly it's just like it's coming but if you explore like what's underneath um then you're actually become a good person because you're choosing like the light and you as opposed to the negative and if you're aware of the negatives there it's less likely chance that that's going to sneak up on you if you're going to see it coming um so i just would like I think it's important for everybody to explore their own mind, explore the mentality, like all thoughts. If you have any thoughts, don't let them just go or like think that they're nothing, like observe them, like learn from what they are and then like work on your mental game. And also I would say everybody needs to not be scared of discomfort, whether it's ice bath, it's sitting and meditating for 30 minutes, it's exercise, eating a good diet. Like I think we find our best selves through discomfort. Um, and also if like you are going through something that is discomfort from you know, mental health problems and just like keep going because it may seem like you're in a hole that you're never climbing out of, but there's always a way to climb out of it. And if you have faith, especially if you have faith in God, I seriously feel that God places the things in your life that will lead you out of it. Like, I think that the higher power in life, like God led me down the path of meditation, ice baths, like talking to the therapist at the right time I needed to, like led me down this path that I kept leaning into like God. And it's like, all of a sudden my mind's healthier than it's ever been. And it's not by accident, you know? So I would just encourage everybody to like um, absolutely just do the work mentally no matter what. Okay. Well, thank you so much for doing this. Um, I had a good time talking to you. I hope you had a good time too. Yeah, thanks for having me. All right. Uh, I will talk to you later. Thanks so much again to Mason for being a guest on the show this week. If you have a story you want to personally share on the show, want to be read on air, or a topic you'd like to see discussed, find us on Instagram and Facebook at Just a Person Pod, or send us an email at justapersonpod at gmail.com. We'll see you next Monday with another new episode.